year-long study called The Story of Jesus, looking at his life uh, as outlined in the Gospels. We've been reading through that. We finished that in the fall, and we're working our way through preaching uh, up to this series. We've been looking basically chronologically at the major events. We sort of left Christmas off, you know, for Christmas time. We were looking at the major events in his life, and now this series is not so much I- chronological events as aspects of who he was and how he lived, in particular prayer. What kind of prayer life did Jesus have? What did he say about prayer? How did he pray? What can we learn about that in our own lives and our own prayers as well? And the last couple of weeks, we've been talking in depth about that. And I, I've been thinking about, uh, as a pastor, I talk to a lot of people about their spiritual lives, and prayer comes up fairly often. Most people have some hang-ups with that. How many of you, by show of hands, have ever wondered if you're praying it right, if you're doing it right when you pray? Am I getting the words right? Did anybody listen? Is it praying to the wall? Does this thing actually work? What, how, what happens here? How, and depending on how you grew up, you know, you may have some, we may have different kinds of hang-ups with prayer. And I, my son, as I mentioned, is in college, and when he was going, uh, thinking about that, we filled out the, it was then FAFSA, now it's changed to FSA, the financial aid forms. You've all done that, moms and dads who have kids in college. It's a long and involved process, right? They ask you lots of personal questions. They want to know your bank account. They want to know, like, expenditures. They want to know all this information about you and your family and your, and your uh, Social Security number and your spending habits and your net worth and all this sort of, sorts of things. Why? And, you're, and you fill all that stuff out and submit it. It's kind of personal, really. Why? In the hopes that they're going to say, okay, we're going to give you we're going to give you grants and scholarships and, and aid of some kind. What if, I was thinking about this, what if you did all that, filled out all that stuff and sent it all in, and you got a call from the financial aid director of that institution who said, hey, we'd like to get to know you personally, I'd like to have coffee with you. And you thought, okay, fine, it's supposed to be part of the process, didn't see it on the application, but let's have coffee. And you go to coffee, and all they do is talk about, like, sports and your kids and their family and your family. Money never comes up. You think, that's weird. And they call you the next week. Hey, let's, uh, let's go, let's have dinner. What? Well, maybe this is just a different kind of, okay, let's have dinner. You have dinner, and again, they talk about your life and your, what you're into and how things are going in your family, but they never talk about money at all. And eventually, you get up the courage and say, hey, listen, this is great and everything, but what does this have to do with financial aid? And they say, oh, this has nothing to do with that. I just want to be your friend. How many of you be like, uh, that's not what I was after, right? I filled that stuff out. I answered all your questions. I went to coffee because I'm thinking you're going to give me what I want, aid, right? I think a lot of people, even in the church, approach prayer that way. We do the stuff. Fill out the forms, so to speak. Say it right, you know, because we want stuff. We want answers and responses and things from God. And God's going, I want a relationship with you. I want to know you personally. I want you to know me. Not that, not that it's wrong to ask for stuff, but the primary purpose, I hope you're getting this in the last two weeks, in a prayer for a Christian is not stuff. It's not our agenda. It's to know him. Many years ago, when I was starting out as a, as a youth pastor in a different church, I was brand new in, ministry, in full-time ministry and didn't know much of anything. And a, a man who I barely knew, wasn't a parent of any students that I was leading, just a guy that I had seen around. I knew he was very involved in the church and had been there a long time. And sort of, uh, I didn't really know him at all, and I wasn't even sure of his first name. But he knew me. He pulled me aside on a Sunday morning, unprompted, just un- unsought for, and said, hey, I want to tell you something. And I said, okay. And he pulled me aside. He said, I just want you to know, over the course of the last year, I've prayed for you every day. Missed a couple, but almost every day. And I'm going to keep praying for you. I just want you to know that. I was stunned. I thought, why, do I look like I need it? Am I in trouble? Like, why would you, you know? And I had just a, a small view of prayer, you know? But I was deeply touched by this man who I didn't know who had prayed for me daily for a year. And I never even knew it. Think about that. Not only did he tell me that, but he told me specific things. He said, I've been praying for this. I feel like God has given me this verse to share with you. He's praying for me and God's speaking to him about me. It's a little bit creepy. But it's also deeply touching and encouraging. Have you ever had someone pray for you? Have you ever had someone experience like that? Maybe not for a year every day, but someone who told you they're praying for you and you knew it's not just, it's not just talk, they meant it? That they're pray- Besides your mom, right? <laughs> it's kind of a mom's job, and they do. Right? Someone who said, I'm, I'm praying for you. It's a, if you stop and think about that for a minute, that's a, what an incredible thing to say and to do for someone, to pray daily for them. I want to tell you something. If you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you have someone who prays for you every moment of every day, your whole life long. Do you know who that is? It's the church answer. You should all know. Say it. Did you know that? The Bible is clear about this, that Jesus intercedes for you and prays for you every day of your life. Jesus is praying for you. Do you know that? In case you just, don't take me my word for it. Listen to what God's word says in Romans chapter 8, verse 34 on the screen here. 
Romans 8, 34, we're told this. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. And listen to this last line. Who is the right hand of God, and what's he doing there? Who is indeed interceding for us. You know what an intercessor is? Someone who intercedes between you and the Father, praying for you. Approaching the Father on your behalf. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Again, very similar reference here. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Since his death and resurrection and ascension, Jesus has not stopped interceding, praying for those who belong to him. That's an incredible thing right there, isn't it? Just to think about that. So if you think, I don't have much of a Christian family, no one's ever said they're praying for me, tonight you know someone is. The greatest person. The Bible's clear about this. So I want to, just a little side note here. When Christians, when we as Christ followers pray in Jesus' name, you, you know we always close prayers that way, right? That's not just a Christian way of saying the end, or it's over now. Right? I think we just throw that in sort of by habit. What does that mean to pray in his name? All those magic words? If you don't, I've had people, students when I was a youth pastor say, well, if you don't say in Jesus' name, he doesn't hear you. Right? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> you know, like, it's not magic. Why do we say that, pray in Jesus' name? We're, we are acknowledging with our words, with our mouths, these truths, that he is our access he is the way we approach God. God himself comes down in human form to redeem us of our sin and now sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. When we pray in Jesus' name, we're saying that's how, we get to, that's how God hears us, through Christ. He's the way to God. In fact, he says as much for us in John 14, we ask in my name. He tells us to. He did this even while he was on the earth. He prayed for his followers. In Luke 22, there's a story about uh, Jesus predicting Simon's betrayal, Peter to betray him. He says, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you. He knows what's coming. He knows his failure. He prays for him. And in fact, the longest prayer in all the New Testament, the longest prayer of Jesus that we get access to is in John chapter 17, and Jesus in that prayer predominantly, mostly, prays for his followers. We're going to look at it in different sections here. Let's look at the first five verses. John 17, if you have your Bible with you. By the way, this is the true Lord's Prayer. I think the one in Matthew 6 is the really one we call Our Father. That's the disciples' prayer because he's teaching us how to pray. This is actually our Lord praying. So when, uh, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. There's so much in these first five verses. In fact, this, it's kind of ridiculous to try to preach a sermon, one sermon, on John 17. But we're gonna, I've really worked hard to distill it down to like the, the primary point here. In this first section here, uh, Jesus looks upward. This is the first three, three parts of this. That you could break it up in a lot more than three, but for our sake. Three parts here. Jesus looks upward. I want you to pay careful attention to the context of this prayer. In the very beginning, he says, Father, the hour has come. What does he mean? The hour has come. What hour has come? In John 16, and you can do this, go home and read the chapter before this, the context for this, Jesus has been talking extensively about his death and betrayal and the impact that will have on his followers. He's speaking to his disciples, his followers. And he says to them, I'm going to go away. You're going to be sad for a while, but your grief will turn to joy. You'll have trouble in this life, but take heart, I've overcome the world. And with many other words, he's talking about his death, his coming death. In John 17, he says, Father, the hour has come. What hour is he talking about? The hour of his death. Think about that for a minute. That's the context in which Jesus prays this prayer. Keep that in mind as we go. What would you pray for if you were facing the hour of your death? Who would you pray for? How would you pray? Get me out of this. Right? What would you, how would you pray if you were facing the hour of your death? It's amazing to me. Even as he's preparing himself for the incredible ordeal of the cross, he knows what's coming. If you knew you're facing your death and how you were going to die, how would you pray? Even then, Jesus prays primarily not for himself, but for his followers. When he knew his death was imminent, 
you and I were on his mind. Not just his followers then. We'll skip ahead. This is not on the screen, but verse 20. In verse 20, he says, I do not ask for these only, meaning his disciples right there in the context of this prayer, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. He's praying for his followers then and in the future, meaning you and me. On the, on the, at the hour of his death, Jesus had you on his mind. Think about that for just a minute. And he has you on his mind even now. In fact, he did this even when he was on the earth, as we talked about. This is incredible. What did he pray for then? What specifically did he pray for? Notice in the first five verses, it's all over the place. He prays for glory. In verse 1, glorify your son. In the second half of verse 1, that I may glorify you. In verse 4, I glorified you when I was on the earth. Verse 5, glorify me in your presence. And then later, in verse 22, he says, I want them to have the glory that I had. I share my glory with them. Now, glory is, is a, it's, um, it's a complicated term for us. We don't, it's, not, it's not part of our common language. We don't understand it usually. It can be confusing. Um, in John, well, let's see. I'll put this succinctly. Jesus suffers, dies, is resurrected, and returns to the Father. All for his glory. And then in his prayer, in verse 22, he says, I want them to share in my glory. The word glory in Hebrew is the word kavod, K-A-V-O-D. You pronounce it like, almost like a B, kavod in Hebrew. And the word in Greek is doxa, D-O-X-A. It's where we get our English word doxology. Um, in Hebrew, the word literally can be translated weight, W-E-I-G-H-T heaviness or significance. Pastor Brian, I believe, has talked about this in the past. To the Bible's point of view, glory is not some shiny thing in the heavens or something that's hard to define. It literally means weight or significance. So that's the noun. To glorify is to ascribe significance, weightiness to a person or thing. That's how you glorify. You say, that's important. He's important. Most important. With your life, with your actions, and with your lips. So what does it mean then when Jesus says in verse 22 I, that they may share in my glory? That they, meaning us, may share in his significance, weightiness. Whoa. Pause and think about that for a minute. Jesus says, Father, glorify me because I've glorified you. And then in verse 5, it's something very interesting. He says, and I want to have again the glory I had before the world began. What is he talking about? Well, in Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, when Jesus came to earth in the flesh, he emptied himself. What he's saying there is he set aside part of his divine glory to come into our flesh for a time. And now he's saying, Father, I'm facing my death and, my, and the resurrection ascension, and I, want to, I will take back up again that glory which I emptied myself of for a time. And I want my followers to share in that. That is it's, it's mind-blowing. At least it is for me. Maybe you're going, I don't know what you're talking about. He wants us to share in the significance, the weightiness, the importance, the glory of his Father, of God. What does this mean? We are called, I'm going to say this over and over again throughout the rest of the sermon. We are called to live as answers to his prayer in John 17. How is your life going to be an answer to what Jesus prayed. And let's start here. How is your life going to glorify him? Going to reflect his, going to share in his glory? Perhaps the best place I know of to read about this, we don't have time to get into it too much tonight, is in an essay by a man named, can you guess? I got teased for not bringing him up the last two sermons, so here you go. You're going to get a good dose of C.S. Lewis tonight. Uh, he wrote an essay called The Weight, W-E-I-G-H-T, of Glory. One of the best essays probably in the English language, certainly one of his best. I would encourage you to read it and get it online. And it's also a collection of essays by the same name. But that essay, he talks about what it means, the significance of the glory of God and the glory that God puts in us as his followers, human beings. Lewis writes this, The load or weight of my neighbor's glory should be laid on my shoulders. It is a burden so heavy only humility can carry it. Then later on he says, There are no ordinary people. You've never talked to a mere mortal. You ever heard that quote before? Nations, empires, civilizations, institutions, these are mortal. But people, you and I, people that you see every day, are immortal. 
They're going to live forever in one of two destinations. And they have a significance, a weightiness to them that God put in them. We're all on our path, a path of being glorified in him or the opposite, Lewis says. The focus on the glory of God is the very heart of Jesus' life and mission. He's all about God's glory, not his own. And so should we be. He prays that for us. I want you to notice something about this prayer so far. Most of us pray, and I'm included in this, when we pray, remember back to the example of the the, the financial aid forms, right? We pray to conform God or to, to inform God about our issues and then to conform God to our agendas, right? Like we're, we're letting God know, hey, I don't know if you're paying attention down here, but I got some stuff going on. And I'd like you to do this and this and this. We might not say it that way, but that's essentially how we come to God, right? God, I have needs and there's issues and please intercede for me and fix this and, and heal this relationship and heal this person that I care about. And what about that job I've been praying for? And on and on and on it goes. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for those things. But notice in Jesus' prayer, in the first five verses, he says nothing about those kinds of things for his followers. He does not pray to conform God to our agenda. He prays to conform us to God's agenda, his glory. That's what his whole life is about. And he prays that for us, that our lives might be about that. This is convicting for me. My life's not always about God's glory. I want it to be. Now, this is kind of the difference as an example between someone who says to you, uh, hey, hey, Dino, how can I pray for you? And you might tell me your needs, right? Because I want to pray according to your issues, your needs, your agenda. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. That's different, though, than someone who comes to you and says, I've been praying for you. I've been praying this for you. I'm not asking you about your needs. I'm praying God's will as he reveals to me for you. That's what Jesus is doing. He's not going, hey, let me in. Let me know what I can do for you. He's saying, I have an agenda for your life. It's about the glory of the Father. And the best thing we can do is understand that and submit to that. And I have spent way too much time on the first point. God's primary agenda for us is that we be conformed to and reflect his glory. Let's go to the next section of the, of the, of the I knew this would happen, I knew it, the verses uh, 6 through 19. I have manifested your name to the people whom you have given me out of, out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying uh, for the world, excuse me, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and all yours are mine. I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them. And not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He's speaking about Judas there. We won't have time to talk about that, but you can ask me later. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may, uh, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the, word has, the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world, sanctify them in the truth your word is truth as you sent me into the world so i have sent them into the world and for their sake i consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth again 10 sermons in here easy but uh, let's try to unpack the primary point here there's so much going on in these 14 verses i want to focus on the last four to five verses the heart of this section of jesus prayer jesus looks outward First he looks upward to the glory of God and calls us to that same glory, reflection in our lives. And then he looks outward, outward to his disciples and to the purpose that he redeems them and calls them to be his. Um, I think he he prays for our mission, our purpose in life. What is mission? Outside the Christian vernacular, if you say I'm on a mission, or in military terms, we have a mission. What does that mean? It means my purpose and priorities and agenda and comfort and security are all secondary to the greater cause, right? I have, I've got to do something here, and regardless of how I feel about it, this is, what I'm, this is what I'm about. So I set aside my agenda for this cause. It's not different. I think the word maybe has lost some of its significance for us. In the Christian terms, 
Jesus had a mission. Notice how many times in that text, you can go back and look at it, he, he talks about him being sent into the world. This is crucial. The message of the gospel is not just that Jesus was born in a manger. It's that he was sent into the world. Not just randomly born, but he was sent from the Father for a purpose, on a mission. What's Jesus' mission? You should all be able to answer that one. You don't have to do it out loud. You know, oh, is this a quiz? No, I don't mean that. I mean, we should all be able to talk about what his mission is. To live the perfect life and die the, 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 the perfect sacrificial death out of love in your place. To redeem all those who would trust in him. To usher in the kingdom of God and to, and to live out the glory of God and to call people to himself. That's his mission. To die sacrificially for the world. That's his mission. And what's our mission? Because over and over again, Jesus says, he is sent and we are, he is sending us. We also are sent ones. We have a mission. Our mission is to make the world believe his mission. I'm going to put it as simple as I can. Jesus' mission is to redeem the world by a sacrificial death and love. And our mission is to make sure the world sees and knows that. That's it. We could talk about it in different terms, and, and the theologians out there might want to add and subtract some things to, from it, but essentially that's it. God, Jesus is sent. Remember, he lives for God's glory, and he prays that we would too. He's sent on a mission, and he prays that we would be too. We reflect his life in these ways. Our mission is to let the world know and believe in his mission. Now, there's another aspect to this concept of being sent that's really important for us to understand. In verse 11, he says that we're in the world. In verse 14, he says we're not of the world. In verse 15, he says we're not, we're not out of the world. In verse 18, he says we're sent into the world. It's confusing, isn't it? In the world, not of the world, sent in the world, but not out of the world. What, what, is, it, what is he talking about? Um, again, there's a lot in here. Let's, let me try to break it down simply. In the world... So not out of it, but in it. His point is this. He prays that we would be in the world. You're like, well, I'm living. I'm on the earth. He means in, 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 really engaged in it. Here's what he means. There's no way the world is going to believe in the mission of Jesus if we, his followers, withdraw from the world. If we take the approach of, hey, there's a lot of evil and corruption out there. Let's hide away, build a fence, Keep all the good people in, the bad people out. And, you know, my, my, I've shared this many, many times. I have a good friend who says too many Christians approach the, the, their life on earth by going into a public restroom at a gas station. You go in, you do what you have to do as quick as possible, touch as little as possible, and get out as soon as possible. Right? That's not how he calls us to live. Right? He says, it, it, Jesus' point is this. If you're, not engage, if you're not passionately and compassionately engaged in the world in which you live, how will anybody believe the mission? How will anybody believe? If, if you withdraw from it, if you huddle up with only Christians and try to just to keep everybody safe and protected and hang on till heaven, you, the mission will fail. It's lost. And, but he also says, on the other hand, and again, we could spend a lot of time on this, but I'm going fast. He says, we're not, we're, though we're in the world, we're not to be of the world. We're not to be out of it. What does that mean? Not out of the world. On the other hand, there's no way the world is going to believe in the mission of Jesus if we look and act exactly like the rest of the world. You see how those two things have to be in tension? There's no way the world will believe in the mission of Jesus Christ if we withdraw from it. There's also no way the world will believe in the mission of Jesus Christ if we look no different from it. If we are the same materialistically driven, selfish, focused on us and our needs, judgmental, narrow, angry, if, that's, if we're no different than everybody else around us, well, why would we expect it? Anybody to go, oh, I'd like to know more about that. I can get that anywhere. It's all around me. That's his point. Father, I pray that they would be in the world, passionately engaged with the world in which they live, caring about their neighbors and the people down the block from them and in their schools and that they work with, sharing the love of Christ with them, serving them selflessly, but yet not so in the world that they're attracted by it in an unhealthy way, that they become just like it. Does that make sense? People that are not in the world are too afraid of it. People that are too in the world are too attracted by it, right? They, 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 they conform to it. I hope that's <laughs> a little clearer. There's a lot, again, so much there. Jesus calls us to be passionately engaged in the world and at the same time totally immune to its corrupting influence. Well, how is that possible? 
I, I can't help asking that question. Maybe it's on your mind too. How, how is anybody going to live like that? The answer is in how Jesus connects two things in his prayer. Holiness or sanctification and mission. Let me try to explain it. If you have your Bible, and this is not on the screen, but look at verse 17 again with me. If you have your Bible with you, you can you know, just I'll read it for you. Verse 17. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Okay, now, what does that mean? Sanctify means to set apart. It means to set apart as holy. He's talking about your pursuit of personal holiness, to set your life apart as devoted to God. Sanctify them, Father. Set them apart by your word, the truth. Then in verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Okay, so you see holiness in 17. In verse 18, what? Mission. God sent me, I send them. I send you. And then in verse 19, what do we have again? And for their sake I consecrate myself, so they also may be sanctified in truth. What's he back to again? Sanctification and holiness. You see how he goes back and forth between those things? That's so important. I know there's churchy words in here, but stay with me. I pray, God, that the people that you've given me, the ones who are my followers, would, would be set apart in their hearts. doesn't mean you're perfect. It means in your heart you want your life to reflect God's glory. You want his word to guide you. You want to conform. You're convicted over your sin. It grieves you when you know you grieve God, and you want to be better, and you want him to change you. Set my life apart. Sanctify me. Because I'm being sent into the world. And if you, there's no mission without holiness. They, don't, they have to go together. There's no changing the world out there through institutions and programs and, and elections and whatever else unless God is transforming you in here. And I'm, I'm, I'm pointing to myself. I mean, I, it's for all of us. They go together. So set my life apart, God, because I'm being sent. So set my life apart, God, right? Jesus says, Father, sanctify them in the truth because I'm sending them into the world, and they're going to need your sanctifying grace in their lives. That's how this mission is going to happen. Uh, often, Christians fall on one side or the other of this sort of equation, right? Some Christians are all about personal holiness, and it becomes legalism. Don't do that. It's unholy, right? You know, like they, all about what you can and can't do to be holy or unholy. Or all about out there, social justice and mission and engagement in the world. These things go together perfectly in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's what he's praying for in our lives. We need them both if we're going to achieve mission. So when he prays us for it to be sent into the world, he asks God for two things. We already talked about one of them, sanctification and our own personal holiness. And the second thing is unity. This brings us to the next section where we read this in one packet in three minutes. It might be a little longer. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. What a prayer. I mean, you could spend <laughs> years on meditating on this prayer, and many have. Jesus here looks forward. So he looks upward to the glory of God, looks outward to our mission and our personal holiness, and then he looks forward in the, to the, the future unity of his followers. He's praying looking forward to the unity of his followers, culminating in verse 23. Let me read verse 23 for you again, because I think it's the centerpiece of this last section. He prays this. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and loved me even... Love them even as you love me. Do you hear that? There's all this oneness, right? That they may be one, that we are one, that every one that we, as we are one. And then in the end, he says, I want to be in them, just as you're in me, and together we might become one, perfectly one. Why? What's the purpose? So that the world, that's the mission, would know that you sent me. Do you hear that? Our unity is connected to people believing in Jesus. 
I, I don't think I paid attention to this until preparing for the sermon, really. The way Christians talk about each other, treat each other, love each other, serve each other, is directly connected in Jesus' prayer to people believing in his name. Did you ever think about that? Apparently, unity is a big deal to God. And it ought to be to us as well. Now, I'm not saying there aren't reasons to, uh, in, inside of what people might call Christianity, to, to say, I'm not sure that's the gospel. I'm not saying there aren't significant differences. But unity matters. Gregory the Great, um, the first, I guess, chief bishop, Catholics would call him the first pope, but it's before the pope was the pope, if you know what I mean. If you don't, don't worry about it. The proclamation of the gospel, apart from the unity of the church, is a theological absurdity. I love that quote. The pro proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ, when we fight and hate each other and treat each other like dirt, makes no sense to the world. It's a theological absurdity. That's his point. Those things have to go together. The unity that Jesus prays for, by the way, is something he possesses in himself. He says, as, may they be one as we are one. What's he talking about there? Who's we? Father, Son, and Spirit existing in perfect harmony and unity since before the world began. He's saying, I want the Christians to reflect that in the way they love each other. Imperfectly, of course, but reflect it. Do you realize, we have to end, but do you realize how desperately we need this prayer today? It's, it's dense and it's complex, and I, I think we, we miss it. But do you realize how much we need this? And this is not something that happened once upon a time long ago. It's recorded for us in these ancient words. Remember how we started. Jesus is praying for you and for me and for us. Well, what's he praying? He's praying that you would reflect the Father's glory. He's praying that you would be sent into the world on a mission, that your life would grow in personal holiness, and that you would be unified with other believers. That's, that's what he's asking God for. You've got your agenda like I do and your list of requests. And there's nothing wrong with that. But never forget, God's agenda is bigger than your list. What's his agenda? It's right there. That you reflect God's glory, that you be sent on his mission, that you grow in personal holiness, and that you'd be unified with other believers. Why? So the world would know that God sent Jesus and believe it. Isn't that awesome? I need that. I need to be reminded that's God's agenda. And I want that to be my primary agenda. If I get that right, then I can sort out all the stuff that's on my list. But it's not first, right? I have a friend who, years ago, um, ap applied, went through the process of uh, getting involved in an elite for, uh, part. Of, he was a, a police officer in a, in a city near, near my town, and he was applying to be on a like elite force for a, I don't know, was a county or whatever it was. I don't remember exactly, but it was a kind of a like the police version of, of uh, special forces, I guess, gang units and whatever else. And uh, he had to go through an intense psych evaluation. And he was a believer, and we were in a group together. And he came to me after that, and he goes, I think I might have failed. I said, why? He said, because on the psych evaluation was a question that says, it said, uh, are you a, uh, on a secret mission from God? And he said, I checked yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, to the world, you check yes, you're crazy. Right? You've got to watch out for that guy. And I, maybe he should have checked no. But the point is, Jesus says, actually, that's exactly what you are. That is exactly what you are. Redeemed by my grace, sent into the world on a mission. Why, what is your mission? So that the, by, by your life and your love for Christ and his work in you and the way you treat each other, the world would say, God sent Jesus. And I want that too. Let's pray. Father, we pause just now to thank you for this incredible prayer. And we, we pause to acknowledge, Lord Jesus, that even now as I pray, you're interceding for us. And you have an agenda for our lives that's far beyond what we can imagine. It's so much bigger than the smallness of our vision. So give us a greater vision, Lord, of who you are and what you want with us. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.